I'm Andre Knott, and on my new podcast, Brownstown, I'm chronicling the sometimes sad but always hilarious story of the last 20 years of Cleveland Browns dysfunction. With the voices of Jim Donovan, Brady Quinn, Tim Couch, Romeo Cornell, Josh Cribbs, TJ Ward, Phil Savage, and many more, we'll track how unbelievably bad decisions and bad luck kept this team down for way too long. So join us as we go tailgating in the Muni lot and diving deep into the dog pound. You're going to Brownstown. Hello, world, and welcome back to week three of NBC Sports Edge's DFS Building Block Show. As always, when I'm not at a wedding, I am your host, John Daigle, joined by friend in life and the man who has won recently in MLB DFS, none other than my teammate, Kyle Dvorak. Kyle, how did week two treat you? Any big picture takeaways you have while the chat gathers here for this edition of Sunday's Main Slate? Uh, week two was a shellacking. Week one was uh, perfectly fine. We talked about week one. We talked about uh, like I, I thought it was OK to play Marquez Calloway. You thought and convinced me that it was because of the late swap equity that he gave you. You just if if it didn't work out before that, say you had a lot of Raheem Mostert, you just swapped off. him, And that worked out well and really saved me because it allowed me to switch off of uh, a bad. I switched off a bad Calloway play. There was no saving me after not playing like Cooper Cup and then not playing Derrick Henry last week. I, I don't think I played particularly bad, though. I think I faded the I was basically fading the uh, the one big game, the Chargers Dallas game. Mm-hmm. And after that, I was like, you don't need to play four percent Derrick Henry. Uh, you know, that's like that's a perfectly fine play. But my lineups didn't need to get that contrarian. I also wasn't playing a lot of Cooper Cup. I was specifically playing, especially with that one, playing Robert Woods and Daryl Henderson as leverage off them because we had only seen one big game from Cooper Cup before the season. It had been basically a 50 split. Cooper Cup, Robert Woods, the only real edge cup had was red zone work. It doesn't look like that so far, but I thought my lineups were so heavily leveraged against the chalk, like the two biggest chalky spots, like Cooper Cup and then the, the game of the week that I didn't need to get to Derrick Henry. So it, it all backfired, but I, I wouldn't change a ton about my process. Although maybe just like when you have Derrick Henry 4%, it doesn't matter what your lineup looks like. You should find a way to work him in. But I don't like, yeah, I got shellacked and it doesn't really bother me. I think I played well enough. I could have done better, but that's just part of playing tournaments. Did you lose a lot of weeks? Christian McCaffrey, Marquez Callaway, skinny stack seemed like a good idea until, well, one, Callaway goes busto, and two, Derrick Henry explodes, and your leverage off of Henry, Christian McCaffrey, who also came in under rostered, uh, doesn't match him anyways. That's what it always comes down to. And to be fair, it came down to the fourth quarter. Even being down two scores in that final 15 minutes, the Titans still ran the ball and got there because (laughs) the Seahawks obviously need to take their defense off the field as much as possible, who, by the way, have the longest time of possession on defense per game so far through two weeks as a defense. So something to monitor if they look tired, by the way, as we move along towards the season. But I will say also, I wasn't here. I said it on the Sunday show, noon p.m. Eastern. Every Sunday morning for start sits. This is not the start sit show, thankfully, but Mm -hmm. we will answer them on Sunday mornings. And I will say I said it then if I were here last week, I would have said it then. And I just want to say it now before we start, because I think it's an important takeaway for everyone playing DFS. And that is the way to play last week, whether you were right or wrong, was to look at the two afternoon games, knowing we had the Bucks on deck against the Falcons and the highly rostered Cowboys Chargers game. And knowing that then play the contrarian pivot options if you choose to do so in Sunday morning slates. For instance, let's say you played Cooper Cup. Even though he had two touchdowns, if that's what you had, you didn't know anything about your opponent's lineups in the afternoon. Because obviously, if you played someone, you wanted to stay with the Cowboys Chargers stack. But if you played someone at 20 plus percent ownership and you still stayed with the Cowboys Chargers stack, it doesn't matter what the Cowboys Chargers stack do because you have one of the higher rostered, chalkier lineups in tournaments. You learned absolutely nothing. And so, again, we are at that position this week. A little more unique, as we'll talk about as we move along here. But we have two amazing games Vikings, Seahawks. And then, of course, the Bucks rams game that are very viable double stacks in the afternoon, whereas we have Derrick Henry and other strong RB options, including Clyde Edwards-Alaire's $4,800 salary on DraftKings at the first game of slate. So it's just something to keep in mind, knowing that how smart and intelligent DFS players are now. We still have an edge, and that is to not be lazy and use our late swap adequately 
Uh, for instance, like putting Henry maybe in like the RB2 position, but then another guy in the afternoon, like a Dalvin Cook having his salary in the flex option. Again, we're going to talk about all this in depth as we move along. Let's go ahead and start here, though. If you're listening to this on Saturday morning, thank you. Also, remember, Friday afternoon, 6 p.m. Eastern, it is an interactive show, and we will get to questions, especially as they fit in our four big topics, the first one being my favorite discussion of the entire week when it comes to DFS, and that is the decision point. The one decision we are trying to make that is annoying the hell out of us as we continue to build lineups throughout the week. So what is your one decision point and the issue you've run into, Kyle, so far this week? So I'm not sure if this will hold. I guess it's like a a two-pronged approach. It's running back, and it's specifically that we have this gap of of really not having what are desirable plays anywhere between 6,500 and like 8,200. You can totally go up to Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry, above that 8K range, but then there's a complete kind of complete drop off until you get back down to 65 ish hundred. And then you get into Saquon Barkley, Joe Mixon. And it's how do you approach the way that that forces you to build in sort of a, a streamlined approach. And I don't like building in a similar roster construction as other people. Ideally I can build lineups that still project somewhat well that spend in completely different areas because of the way that uh, running back is just priced and the plays I want to play at running back, it's going to force you to be particularly streamlined if you do end up playing even like modestly chalky. I don't think there's going to be a complete smash running back play that we're all trying to get on barring, you know, Alexander Madison getting the start or something, but it is going to force you to just generally play a similar roster build one expensive running back plus a cheaper running back and then do the rest with you, what you will. Or do you go the double like 6K? But there's not a ton of there's not like a 7500 running back I'm dying to get to. And maybe that's just me like, you know, not being comfortable with the discomfort of playing a lackluster running back play. And then on top of this, there is the interesting wrinkle that we have two four o'clock running backs, Daryl Henderson and Dalvin Cook, who I'm not sure what their health status is going to be. I feel like we generally learn these types of things before, uh, you know, the one o'clock games lock. But if they don't, that is a very interesting wrinkle to add to the slate. I agree with you. And it sort of blends into my decision point, because what I have noticed while building lineups this week is that there are a ton of obvious and tremendous pivots I love to every high rostered player. Uh, TJ Hawkinson, for example, you're not going to get sneaky with him at all. He's going to come in at top two ownership across sites, but you can play either DeAndre Swift or Quintez Cephas or both in a stack with the Ravens, knowing that we just had four important players, including two starters for the Ravens defense, go on the COVID list. Pernell McPhee also highly questionable in that game, not to mention Jimmy Smith. So the Ravens defense is banged up. Also, they have not been good, not able to rush the passer. And I know it's Patrick Mahomes, but just in allowing 11 and a half yards per attempt quietly behind the scenes last week, the storyline would have been much different had Clyde Edwards-Alaire not fumbled on the final play, and people would have maybe noticed this. Also, Patrick Mahomes' 11.5 yards per attempt was his highest mark since 2019, and the Chiefs averaged 8.5 yards per play, despite the fact we hated everything they did on the rush on the rushing ground. So overall, this defense is still one we want to attack. And as we have seen, the Lions are going to be a nuisance for backdoor covers every single week because – Teams take on the identities of their head coaches. And for as much no quit as Dan Campbell has, the Lions just keep it going into the fourth quarter of every game. Eight of DeAndre Swift's 16 targets have come in the final two minutes of Habs because it's garbage time and they're literally just in hurry up mode to score again. So all are viable options in stacks with the Ravens. I don't think either side will be able to stop the other. Saquon Barkley, you can Easily pivot to Sterling Shepard with Daniel Jones or Kenny Galladay as standalone value. Galladay may be weak right now, but he never loses two touchdown upside. That's the archetype. Those are the types of targets he gets as well. Could be looking at a squeaky wheel week maybe as well in a terrific spot against the Falcons defense that has allowed 40 points per game through two weeks. CEH for the DraftKings price. Again, CEH and Derrick Henry both play in the first slate. So, My idea, and I'll talk about this in depth later, is to not play both of them and rather gather the information for what one of them does and go from there. But you can also pivot his salary to either Sony Michelle or Alexander Madison in late swaps, pending Dalvin Cook status. Cook, of course, did not practice Wednesday through Friday and is highly questionable. Cooper Cup and Robert Woods are going to be top three in roster percentage this week. 
But Van Jefferson played a career high in snap rate. And also we know McFay last year when he played the Bucks, just as teams are doing this year, no, there is no need to try to run against them because you can't. So last year, McFay gave Jared Goff 51 dropbacks. It's probably going to be the same again for Stafford. And Jefferson is off a career high in snap rate and running around 100% of Stafford's dropbacks. And then, of course, Godwin Evans, as we await AB's news as a questionable but looking more doubtful than anything, whereas you can also use Gronk if you want to pivot off Hawkinson. I think Andrews is also a good pivot there too. Or just leave it blank, knowing that you have Gronk and Higby in the afternoon slate, because I think Higby's going to come in highly under-rostered as well. So it just comes a matter of how you want to play your stacks when the ex- when the expensive players get ruled out, when and if, for instance, if DeAndre Hopkins is out, everyone goes to Rondo Moore, who's in the noon slate. And that then opens up double st- expensive double stacks, Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, for everyone. So you just have to think about this is the exact way everyone else thinks. How do I want to get contrarian from this, even if it is Mahomes, CEH, and Hill or Kelsey instead? And so for me, it's just about what pivots you want to play and which ones you are most confident in right now i will say i love reserving on DraftKings. this is the way i lean right now i don't know if you have another lean i like holding the flex spot for dalvin cook in the afternoon and i don't even think i'm going to play cook it's a matter of then i can pivot to a skinny stack with gronk and van jefferson and the tight end and flex spots for cook's 8400 8600 salary i believe there or i can choose to go higby and like another player uh godwin evans or someone at lesser value in the afternoon knowing we also have the seahawks and vikings to go to if i choose to do that yeah i love that i think uh if we don't know if we don't know the status of dalvin cook heading into like once the one o'clock games lock or like you know 10 minutes before or whatever Mm -hmm. You have to leave a spot for potentially Alexander Madison. I wouldn't say like Alexander Madison is a must play if he ends up getting ruled the starter. You know, Dalvin Cook's out as of 1130 in the morning or whatever. I guess that'd be the locks for the previous or the the one games. But, you know, Schefter drops the bomb overnight. Dalvin Cook not playing. Alexander Madison becomes obvious chalk. I don't think you have to play him there. We've seen the pricing floor come up on these backup running backs for DraftKings. I don't think it's a mandatory play like maybe it would be in previous years. But if we don't know and say Dalvin Cook is ruled out at at three o'clock or whatever or whatever uh, that'd be yeah about three o'clock um i think almost you were going to get such a low ownership relative to the optimal roster percentage on someone like madison and if we don't know the status of dalvin cook heading into that game then maybe he also comes in particularly unpopular because we know the field doesn't use late swap it's one of the biggest advantages we can have is you and i are going to be acting on information from the time you know from right now from the, the beginning of the week all the way up until that final 425 game locks you out. Whereas our opponents are waking up on Saturday, throwing in some lineups, and that's about it. So the more we can utilize information, especially from that 101 to 424 window, if we gain new information, our opponents are so unlikely to use it. It's like probably less than 5% of people in a large field GPP are actually going to be late swapping. It's just so underutilized. So leaving yourself that optionality, especially on a slate where we know that if we don't know, you know, the status of Dalvin Cook or Daryl Henderson, we can gain such an advantage there that if we don't know one, you know, 15 minutes before the one o'clock games, that becomes such a high V EV part of your lineup to just leave open for different options. And then even normally it is still a good way to play because as you were talking about, you can gain so much information based on the results of the one o'clock game. Not even if we get injury news, Mm -hmm. but like you said, that is just another tool we have in the tool belt to beat our opponents with, let alone the fact that we could actually get meaningful injury news. So if we don't know with Dalvin cook, I think you almost have to just leave him as a a blank spot in your roster at one o'clock because you can pivot actually you were hoping the Schefter bomb on Dalvin Cook doesn't happen because you want to use that information you want to be the one willing to attack and so I would say if we don't get that news Alexander Madison is almost like must play and must be your placeholder because then you are allowed to switch and get him at significantly lower roster numbers in the afternoon, knowing he's just naturally going to come in less rostered. So, yeah, I actually think like no matter what happens, I'm either going to. Well, what you do is you leave Dalvin Cook's salary, 8600 on DraftKings, uh, 9Ks on FanDuel in your placeholders if you're in late swap contests on FanDuel, and then you go from there, and then you adjust as you move along. That, of course, means either one of your receiver spots or your tight end, like I said, Gronk or Higby, have to come from the afternoon as well. But I think that's something you're totally comfortable with, knowing Higby and Gronk are going to come in less rostered than the, uh, even less than 
Andrews most likely, even though I still love Andrews, but definitely Hawkinson, definitely Waller, definitely Kelsey. And of course, both those guys have two touchdown upside and the ability to match at a onesie position like we saw Higby week one, even though we know his 100% usage last week, it just didn't show up in the box score. And then of course, Gronk, two touchdowns. No one wants to believe it continues happening, even though his usage is not going away anytime soon. He continues to be a full-time player, top six in routes run among tight ends. So yeah, I don't mind leaving both of those spots as placeholders ready to attack in the afternoon. Yeah, and if, like, even if, say, you, like, I would probably just jam Madison if we got the, the news after the 1 o'clock, but just leaving, like, say you have the, the late stack, I perf- I still think it's perfectly fine to go for, you know, to swap down and play Madison and Justin Jefferson or something like that because Madison isn't priced in a way that both Dalvin Cook and, and Justin Jefferson going off, getting 40 points, doesn't seem incredibly likely. You just need a ton of offense. Madison, that's not necessarily the case. They can both survive with Jefferson having 40 and Madison getting 25 or something like that. That's more realistic. But man, like what I wouldn't pay to have Dalvin Cook ruled out at three o'clock. Like I, I think I would literally give like three or four hundred dollars for that alone. Like the EV that would be <laughs> for me I, would literally be worth a few hundred dollars. I will cash app at Shefty right now right, if yeah. I need to, just to help out my high stakes tournaments. Uh, your highest rostered player, though, for week three, taking into account injuries and all the news we have who will it be and by the way if it's not a highest roster player if you'd rather discuss because again we do this show curb your enthusiasm on the fly which i prefer because conversation to me brings out more intelligence than just like strategically talking about this uh it works hand in hand so if you have like a a recreational tournament dart you'd rather talk about i'm sure everyone would love to hear that too or both of them yeah, I'll start with the the most uh, the player I'll have most exposure to. I feel like this. I'm really interested to see the ownership on uh, on Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I there are so many options. Like you said, I think Saquon Barkley is probably end up being the chalk. Joe Mixon. I know they're away at Pittsburgh, but Joe Mixon has seen uh, like it's like a 45 or 49 to five split of the carries and like a six to three split of the targets among yeah. the, among the Bengals backfield. So I, I think in that range, you have those two guys. You have Najee Harris, who on the other side is the home favorite and is literally doing the exact same thing to a greater extent than Joe Mixon. I think people are going to be living in that range. I hope they are, because I think at that extent, you get Clyde Ertelaire still not, not unpopular. You're just never going to get the Chiefs' number one running back at like 50, 4,900 being unpopular. But if you can get him on maybe... 10% of rosters at his price. It is just simply so easy. One touchdown is probably a break even profit and they have the highest implied team total of the slate. Obviously they're favorites. The chiefs are always favorites. They're seven point favorites. So I think that is probably where I'm going to go because I don't think, uh, I don't think the way people are building rosters is going to funnel them directly into Clyde Ertelaire. He will just be a, a relatively popular play because of his obvious like points per dollar projection. But I just think anytime you can, like, it's the season long argument. Anytime you can get this exposure to the running back, number one running back of the Chiefs, that's probably where I'm going to be going. I'm not too happy about, uh, I'm nervous about it, about how popular he's going to be. If the cards flip and he's 24% owned in one of the big contests, I think I've probably made a minus EV bet. If he comes in at, at 10% of rosters, I, I'm probably happy with that bet. And that's where I'm leaning now is that he'll stay sub 15 at at most. What do you think you mentioned Joe Mixon because it's a bad spot with Cincinnati Is Cincinnati at home on the road. They're at home, right? Are, I believe they're on the road. Okay. On the road. Uh, technically a bad spot, but I actually think it's a really good spot for Mixon. Uh, I'm actually disappointed. You said you think he's going to come in rostered. Do you think he'll be one of the higher, higher roster backs? I think he'll probably be top. I'd say six, seven, eight, somewhere in that range. I think, I think uh, when Dalvin Cook is kind of hard to talk about, because we just don't know what we've got, you know, about what, or less than 48 hours to figure it out. Mm-hmm. So I think Henry coming off the obvious smash game and not getting a massive price hike against any team that like, how are they even going to string together possessions? Even if it is Carson Wentz, immobile, uh, you know, five, he's sprained more ankles than he has or whatever. I think Henry is probably the people, the, the guy people pay up for. Then moving down from that, you get this cluster of Mixon, Barkley and Harris that are probably grouped together in the top eight. I think they're all kind of, I don't know which one it's going to be. I kind of lean Barkley. I think he just has so much name brand cachet that I think he's like the top three running back. But then I think shortly after him, that's probably getting into the mix and Harris territory where it's the same argument as Barkley. They're just not as like literally popular in terms of their brand value.
I am looking at our friends of Establish the Runs DFS projected ownership. On the screen, if you're participating in the show, I have our own DFS toolkit, our top five projections and points per $1,000 right now that we are showing to everyone for free. So tune in every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. But projected ownership, yeah, I'm seeing on FanDuel, Joe Mixon top three. So that makes sense there since he's only 6,700 and we know his workload well over both Samaj P. Ryan and Chris Evans to this point. So that's disappointing. Really like the contrarian option. I guess the spin would be Jonathan Taylor, who's going to come in completely overlooked since everyone is only worried about the Colts quarterback situation and Derrick Henry, since we may be eliminating Dalvin Cook. Now that I talk about it, Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook might be the play and then spin off Dalvin Cook in the afternoon. Anyways, though, uh, whereas it's not – Taylor's workload that we're worried about at all. I mentioned it on a good football show earlier this week in our preview show, 39 touches, a league high touches inside the 10, also including six carries inside the five that he just hasn't scored on just yet. And although the pivot, everyone's going to pay down for the Titans defense and Derrick Henry to correlate, which makes sense. But also that's why my pivot, not only off Derrick Henry, but I love the Bengals defense because it's going to go overlooked in that same price range with the Titans. But then again, If everyone's thinking about it in that way, probably Jonathan Taylor is the ultimate pivot because, of course, he's going to have the usage no matter what. And then we have to cross our fingers that he's going to score on that usage. It's not even about him coming in the low roster. He's definitely going to do that since everyone's obsessed with the situation around him and not him. But in that middling price point, because everyone else only wants to pay down for CEH or pay up for Derrick Henry, Taylor, now that I talk about it, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, when I was when I said earlier that a lot of people are going to be living in that like 6k to 6500 range and then there's a dead zone that I was afraid like it's the the comfortable with being uncomfortable thing. Here's yeah. the name I thought of, right? Because I think exactly what you said. It's Derrick Henry's going to be very popular and the Titans defense obviously going to be very popular and cheap. They face at best a banged up uh Carson Wentz who takes a ton of sacks, throws a ton of interceptions. It's not that hard to figure out that that's going to be every like a preferred play by a lot of people as soon as you get out of that 6500 range on DraftKings, you hit jonathan taylor who's on the opposite side of that if you are getting a lot of of popularity funneled to this specific combination of derrick henry and and the titans defense the exact opposite play of that is playing jonathan taylor he's the guy who came to mind saying it's very uncomfortable i think the indianapolis offense is probably not going to be good but at, at you know two percent, three percent of rosters, and probably negatively correlated to a very specific build, a lot of people are going to be going with that defense plus Derrick Henry combo. He he doesn't have to have a great probability of hitting; it just needs to be greater than like four percent. And he's a very good running back who, as you said, he's getting all of the goal line looks. He just hasn't converted. I believe he was first in combined rushing and receiving fantasy points expectation. Mm-hmm. He is also uh, last in <laughs> points over expectation because he is so he well he got stuff what three times I believe last week or two weeks ago at the one yard line something like that but it shows their commitment to using him in that role if if they just play a boring game they went don't even have to win you know they just play put up 20 points but both of them are taylor touchdowns and they're not throwing the ball a lot that kills the titans defense because they're not getting a ton of sack opportunities and taylor probably if he can establish some like some control some time of possession control can negatively correlate with derrick henry so that's like it's the grossest leverage play and it's just it's perfect that's exactly what tournament plays are made of i do wish there was another expensive receiver though maybe there is maybe because of Derrick Henry coming in likely one of the highest rostered running backs there is a chance there to play Travis Kelsey and Tyreek Hill together instead uh as the leverage off Derrick Henry since like Kelsey can match Henry's points I mean any time of the day and it's going to be on un- that that double stack with those two without Mahomes will be under rostered because everyone cannot fit Henry Hill and Kelsey in the lineup. So maybe that's the pivot because we know we don't need Mahomes for Hill and Kelsey. We didn't in in best ball. We didn't in redraft leagues and we don't in DFS either. Also, that leads into my actually, I love it now that I talk about it because it leads into my most roster player. And that is I'm taking a stand on Justin Herbert, especially I thought I was going to be sneaky with Lamar Jackson. It turns out everyone got into the Ravens Lions game, which is very unfortunate because I bet the over on Sunday and thought I was going to be well ahead of that one. But the way everyone works now, everyone's just smarter now. So they just gradually get to these moments at the end of the week. So I think Herbert's coming in under rostered, especially when people look at Justin Fields 
and then think about, well, Justin Fields, like if everyone's going to play him, then I can pivot to Trevor Lawrence or Daniel Jones, all who I like, by the way. Justin Herbert gets lost in the fold, even though the Chargers are one of only two offense to run at least 70 plays in both their games this year. And the Chiefs have allowed over seven yards per play in both their games this season, whereas the issue has not been with the Chargers offense. Uh, efficiency wise it has just been getting into that freaking paint because they have 37 total points through two games because they have the second worst scoring percentage inside the red zone fortunately here comes the chiefs who have allowed opponents to score on eight of eight red zone possessions so i'm going to go back in full faith with a charters double stack most likely uh herbert mike williams i need to see about jared cook i don't know if i it, the question is, can he get there over Gronk, Hibby, Andrews, Hawkinson? No, I don't think he can because now we're talking about matching the top tight ends. He has to have two touchdowns, so maybe you have to get a little lucky. Maybe I go there. Either way, Herbert and Mike Williams for sure. Maybe Eckler in a sneaky double stack as well. Of course, the second highest target share among running backs in week two. And then you can still play, if you fade Derrick Henry, Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. And like that's your big game stack that if everything goes off, of course, can pop and match anything else that happens throughout the afternoon. So I actually I think I actually like that now that I think then I talk about it out loud a lot. Yeah, I think you are pointing to another just avenue that I am going to take, which on top of the the Derrick Henry uh, leverage, I do think the most popular game, just like last week, is going to be one of the highest scoring totals of the week. It's the, uh, Los, again, a Los Angeles team this time, the Rams versus the Bucks. Not because I think it's that much of a better game. And I think people recognize it's not that much better than, say, the Chiefs game, which has a total that is uh, a point less, I believe. Yeah, it's just right. one point less. But the prices in this game are so good. The thing is... It doesn't matter what the prices are if the game ends up scoring 24 to 17. That's a fine score. But we saw last week, like you can put up a ton of yards and still if you don't get in the paint, like the Chargers last week had, I believe, two tight end touchdowns that were called back by penalties. They had a red zone field goal and a red zone interception. Like they completely bungled a possible like five touchdown banger. And that's kind of what you're hoping for from the Rams game is that it doesn't really matter what the the prices on the guys are because like all the receivers in that game are like 6K, which you like if, if you wanted to keep the the popularity of the game low you would have them priced up to you know seven and a half k that's why we're going to have your potential for your middling you know not unpopular but your middling popularity tyreek hill mahomes type of stack your justin herbert double stacks is because the prices are 10 percent less attractive but that's going to funnel far more than just a slight split in popularity to that rams game so for me if you move off of derrick henry instead of just using that salary to play the obvious ram stack like the odds of Kansas City's game shooting out is materially not any different than the right. than the Rams game. It's, it's a point, you know, the, the over under is a point different. It's, you know, what's that? A, a few percentage points less likely to shoot out. But the reason it's going to be unpopular is just because it costs a lot. I'm OK with it costing a lot if it simply just boat races all the other games on the slate. And who would be surprised if a game that featured Justin Herbert, rookie of the year and Patrick Mahomes, like the greatest quarterback at his age of all time, if that game happened to outscore Tom Brady versus Matt Stafford? I know I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it is the most likely outcome, given that it's not the highest total. But do I think it's it's far, uh, you know, going to be far less popular? Basically, all of the games that are in that 50 to 54 point total range are going to be less popular than they should be because of the simple pricing of the Rams game. That's my lean. I think that game just goes too and, popular for what it's worth. And don't forget, uh, Frank Clark ruled out and uh, Tredavious Ward, Traverius Ward, I believe, is questionable. He played 97% of the Chiefs snaps last week. On the other side of the ball, Chris Harris and, is out and Joey Bosa is highly questionable after he didn't practice all week, which enhances both offenses. So, yeah, it does seem odd to say that one's going to come in under roster, but the the thing is maybe not so much altogether, but just the way we stack it will be different from the field, knowing they're going to come in on other games and no one's going to go truly like overboard with this one, knowing the Rams and Bucks away. Also, whether we fade Henry or not, you can use Van Jefferson as a cheap pivot there or a cheap option in the afternoon to help you get to these other spots as well while holding out on Alexander Madison. So, yeah, I like that a lot. Do you have any thoughts, by the way, as Joey asked on James White or Javonta or more importantly, a player in the same price range as CEH that you would pivot off CEH for? Let's exclude Madison for a second if you have any other thoughts in that range. 
Yeah, I think for me, it's probably mostly looking down to get to Clyder's Lair because outside of that, you are losing like a lot of projected points. At that point, I'm more likely just to, to pay up. The only other switch could be if like Daryl Henderson is out, Sony Michelle, but Sony Michelle actually didn't come in until after Jake Funk. So even that to me seems like it'd be a bit thin. Uh, so Tevin Coleman, I don't, I just saw is uh, like as I was logging on, is not playing. I know he wasn't a big threat, but like any, like maybe Michael Carter at forty eight hundred. He saw mm-hmm. eleven carries last week, also three targets, and he looked like a guy who could be like I don't think he's uber talented, but he could have been like a three down back. You know, he was in a committee in college. That's because he was it with another really talented back that you brought up. So I don't know, maybe that's where you could go. Honestly, though, I do think if I'm paying down, it, it's very likely to be Clyde Hilaire. You could possibly go with like Neam Hines. He would fit the game script that's projected to to befall his team. But uh, paying down for me is primarily Clyde. I think there are some real like Millie Maker. Like I said, Hines, that's fine. I think, you know, Michelle would have been up. Well, he'd be a risky, but makes sense as a play. James White to me, I don't know. James White's game is just so unappealing. I don't really have much interest in it. And the only issue in playing Naheem Hines is that Moreland Mack, for whatever reason, was involved again last week, which took away from Hines, unfortunately. So it's somewhat worrisome when you're getting that low. When CEH, I, I mean, I actually liked this spot. I, I was coming into the week thinking I was going to play him. Then I saw the salary. Uh, and again, he's not he's not really viable on on FanDuel, given his salary. But at the 4,800 on DraftKings is really what we're talking about. And something that you don't necessarily need to get off of, but more you just need to get contrarian around it, which is why we're giving tons of options around it. Uh, also, as Nicholas mentions, yes, Derwin James, Travis Kelsey has played James three times in their careers, and they literally man up Derwin on him because he's big enough and fast enough to manhandle Kelsey. And uh, Kelsey hasn't gone over 60 yards in any of those games, hasn't caught a touchdown. That's not saying I'm I'm not willing to play Kelsey. I'm definitely willing to play Kelsey, probably will. But that is what's happening right now with that matchup with Derwin looking healthy for this week. Uh, I'm curious to know, though, who is your or what situation, whatever it is, is your top fade for week three? Uh, I mean, we've talked about it a lot, so I don't want to belabor it too much. I guess there are two. For me, Derrick Henry, uh, I think he's going to be super popular and just like a, a good rule of thumb. It's not perfect, but it's probably not to play Derrick Henry when he's super popular because he's going to be, assuming he is not a pass catcher, which who knows, maybe, maybe he is a pass catcher now, but assuming he's not, which has been... Uh, outside of two games in his career, the previous two games, he has not been a pass catcher. He does have a level of fragility to him, and there is a perfect leverage point in Jonathan Taylor. Outside of that, it's probably just going to be both of, of Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. I, I'm just xing this game out and hoping that it goes the under pretty significantly. Oh, interesting. Uh, they Like you, you started the show, and I believe you're right. That they're going to be probably two of the three at minimum, like two of the five, I think, most popular receivers. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the only way I don't X out, I really like that Van Jefferson call. Like he can literally end, like a Cooper Cup drive can involve five catches. Van Jefferson can just cut a drive off with his 28 out through two weeks and a higher air yard share than Robert Woods by about 1%. So maybe that's like one of the exceptions I make to Xing that game out is like the, the Van Jefferson. And, and I know some game. very smart people who are on the under since, again, I, I think it comes in pockets. So like we should identify Brady and his last 10 games since the week 13 by as the player who has 300 yards and three touchdowns per game in his last 10 contest uh, since that's when they truly became a championship team. But before that, they did play the Rams and McFay and it was Staley as well. So again, a different situation, but they did just totally make him a nonsense player for 240 yards, two touchdowns and two picks like a guy who just didn't get there. So that certainly is in play again, especially because it makes sense that like Jalen Ramsey can match up on Gronk. And if a B misses, there are fewer options now to to play. So yeah, uh, I could see that game perhaps going under, even though I, I'm still trying to think about how I'm going to approach her overall, which is also why my top fade is both CEH and Derrick Henry, since they're in the noon slate, uh, I don't know which one I'm leaning towards yet. I'm still trying to figure it out on a Friday afternoon, but I know it doesn't make sense for me to play both knowing they're going to come in highly rostered and then leave me only the flex where I should probably have the running back position available too with Alexander Madison, Daryl Henderson um, and other options available in the afternoon. So I'm definitely going to only play one of CH or Derrick Henry and, you know, if you're doing multiple entries in like $3, $5 tournaments, whatever you play, uh, you can alternate. Even some lineups, you can probably go both and get contrarian elsewhere. But I think it's best to definitely go just one and gather information and then react from there at halftime. Yeah, I think that especially makes sense, too, because of like, I think I think like the, the chakra, this will be like a very duplicated start will be Stafford, Cup, 
Godwin on the other side, Derrick Henry, and then you're starting to get low on salary, at which point CH makes perfect sense. So I think like you, like the correlation within games is obvious. People who play Matt Stafford are more likely to play Cooper Cup. But the correlation, as I talked about earlier, in how you construct your roster is if you're paying for the mid price wide receivers and, and Matt Stafford, who's in that middle, I think he's like 60 something hundred, and then Derrick Henry, you're running out of salary. So you will naturally be correlated into a Clyde Edwards Hilaire lineup. So, not like X, like if you were building 150, saying, if I play Derrick Henry, I do not want Clyde Edwards Hilaire in the same lineup, makes a ton of sense just because that is just another way that you will be funneled into a very similar build like that start i just named will be duplicated like thousands of times in the millie maker or whatever and worst case scenario you'd never want to get here but like you know if you're stuck pivoting to leonard fournette the, no one's going to be on him so screw it just take your chance jones gets benched again or just has six touches again uh seven touches again because that can certainly happen i mean fournette has 29 touches to jones is 11 to through two games so i would just take the pivot and suck it up and hope for the best to get back to even at that point yeah, I don't hate Leonard Fournette. So I believe 11 carries last week, caught four passes. Like he's seeing s- enough volume yes. to not be a dead play. Enough to not yeah. leave like your lineups who have no money in the afternoon. Like, of course, you want to go to the half percent player to be like, just get me in green again. Like we just got to get out of this week and move on to next week to win money. So I don't think it's the worst pivot. Like if you absolutely need to. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's perfectly uh, fine. It's it's thin, but like he'll be so unpopular and he plays on an offense that we always project to score a lot of points. Now, do they project to score them on the ground? Uh, not not really, but he gets enough volume on a team that scores a lot of points that it's not dead. Like, I, right. I don't think you need to get there, but you, like it is an option to have on the table in terms of swaps. It is the worst case scenario if you have left all these options for late swap in the afternoon and suddenly you need to fill like a flex and a tight end or a wide receiver and running back slot. Like, Fournette will be there to comfort's not even the word because it's not comforting. He'll be there to hopefully help you get back in the green. That's okay. Uh, what about some sneaky stacks for this week? Yeah, so I think uh, we've, we've a game we haven't talked about, even though it does have, I believe, the second highest total will be the uh, Seahawks Vikings game. Mm-hmm. I think in general, that one will be uh, unpopular enough. It will be like the third or fourth most popular game among the the high total games you can probably just get away with playing Russell Wilson, but I'm going to have so much Justin Jefferson that I'm probably going to end up finding myself into some like Kirk Cousins lineups, especially given that if KJ Osborne is actually going to be a thing, he's super cheap on drafting. So I believe 3,500 still. So if we think that just, and I, I believe it, makes sense that based on the loss of Irv Smith, Kyle Rudolph, even Chad Beebe, like they don't have any other options to throw their third guy into the lineup. You're going to see a ton of KJ Osborne, even if I think he's run incredibly hot at his price, he doesn't have to keep, going for these long touchdowns like he did last week. So given my my Justin Jefferson uh, affinity, he's seen over half of his team's air yards. He's top 10 or top 15 in weighted opportunity. I'll probably end up working myself into some Kirk Cousins. I think that game is sneaky in the sense of, I think it's like, like I said, I think it's a top five, you know, most popular game to stack, which on a slate with, you know, it has a the second highest or third highest total. That's that's great, you know, leverage over something like the the Rams game. So I'll have a lot of that game if you really wanted to get sneaky Kirk Cousins. But I think Russell Wilson's fine enough. I think he'll be, you know, a top 10 quarterback at most in terms of popularity. <laughs> One more time. You are indeed on mute. I think both of those dang it are going to be under rostered exactly like you said, just because like the Bucks, Rams total and players carry so much weight, like it's overbearing. Uh, the Seattle Vikings game is breaking because it's trying to shoulder all this load. And so I, I just think, and they're awesome plays. Like they really are awesome plays. Like no one's going to stop the other side. It's the Vikings and Seahawks. So <laughs> like they're just, if you, if you need to go, you know, if you don't play one of the 1 p.m. quarterbacks, if you need to go to Russ or Cousins, um, I was on the Cousins double stack last week, and let me tell you, it feels great whenever he has three touchdowns in his first four possessions. Doesn't feel as good whenever they can't score in the second half, but overall, like you can easily get there if the Seahawks defense continues doing what it does, and that is be too good. Just 54 plays run in both of their first game, first two games, and it didn't matter. Russ and this offense are still averaging over seven yards per play. They're awesome. So, like, no one's going to see this game at least see the passing game because everyone's going to be so obsessed with Dalvin and Alexander Madison. So of course you can always pivot to these over the, the cups and the bucks of the world as well. If you need to. 
Yeah, I, I, I'll throw one, uh, you know, one like really grimy tournament dart. Is there uh, any way we can play Freddie Swain? Because it's, it's so hard for me. I don't like when a quarterback like Russell Wilson has some rushing equity, but the longer he's been in the league, the less and less he's rushed. He's not giving you that Kyler ceiling. He's probably not giving you that Josh Allen ceiling. Uh, it's more of a bonus on top of his his passing incredible efficiency when it's working out well uh but i struggled to not double stack a guy who i don't think can put up 60 yards and a touchdown on the ground he could but i I think you're you're probably running pretty thin to actually get that type of rushing performance from russ these days so i don't want to not double stack him because my projection on his on his 35 point game is that at most one of you know 11 of his points really that's even seems optimistic come on the ground he needs 20 some to come through the air so that means unless one of his receivers goes for 200 which uh, like somehow is possible with this team but unless one of his guys goes for 200 multiple of his guys are going off however over the past year it has been so obvious that dk metcalf and tyler lockett have been negatively correlated and the data bears that out I want to bring a second guy into the fold. I don't know who it is. Now without uh, Dwayne Eskridge, uh, Freddie Swain played on over 75% of the team snaps last week, saw five targets. Does that uh, is, is that too thin, or do we think there's any optimism for that? Because I would like to double stack him if possible. I'm just scared of like Freddie Swain just turning out to be a punt gunner, which wouldn't surprise well, me. Well, I mean, like you said, Eskridge and Penny Hart are no longer options. So I think it's viable. I, I don't think I'm going to get there. I think it's more of like a Millie maker or a hundred K entry uh, as in hundred K. Yeah. Entries teams in that tournament sort of lineup, but I don't think it's bad, especially because like when I look, I only see Quintus Cephas, Van Jefferson, KJ Osborne. And then, you know, if you want to go Swain in there as like really truly, Oh, and Michael Hardman as like truly cheap wide receivers, that are viable tournament plays. Maybe I'm missing someone, but that's kind of where I get and the $3,300 to $3,900 guys. So sure, like Swain is there to always pivot from Van Jefferson for the afternoon if you choose to go that route. Also, if AB gets rolled out, maybe you just want to, again, maybe it comes in at low roster tip and you just go Scotty Miller instead. That's always an option too. Oh, Scotty Miller would be uh, wild. He does fit that A-B role where he can both like play slot, but then stretch the field, move around. I'm just not 100% sure. I know someone, I think from the athletics, says it might be Tyler Johnson who takes on that role. I feel more confident in like Swain, Osborne, uh, even like getting up to Michael Hardman are going to be their team's three. But Scotty Miller would be like, uh, Scotty Miller is like one of the few ways you could actually make sort of a very unique leverage Tom Brady lineup or even a Stafford lineup if you wanted him as the run back. Uh, you know, it's very Millie Maker level. But I mean, like it wouldn't be surprising if the Bucks number three receiver turned out to score some fantasy points, given how like how pass heavy they are. They're one of the top teams in pass rate over expectation. And the fact that they shouldn't actually be able to beat their opponent very handily this week. They're only one point favorites, I believe. And remember, uh, everything is only a million maker until we have to get our money back. And then all holds bar or no holds barred in the afternoon as we try to chase that green if we need to with late swap. Uh, I got three for you, actually. One is double stacking lions. Uh, cool. And not even with Jared, not, not even with Jared Goff. Just double okay. stack the lions. And bring it back. Maybe you don't even bring it back. Just double stack the lines with DeAndre Swift and Quintus Cephas, who's a cheap option, uh, to get away from TG Hawkinson. TJ Hawkinson in the last five quarters without Tyra Williams has 13 targets. Cephas has 12. And Swift, if it's permanent garbage time as we expect it to be, then of course you can play Mark Andrews instead of Hawkinson as leverage or Marquise Brown. But either way, then we would expect it to go through the air. And that that works the same for Hawkinson and Cephas. It's not just like Hawkinson garners all these targets automatically since Swift and Cephas are right there. So I like two line, two chief lines players that no one's going to do two. Everyone's only going to do one. Um, even if you want to go Lamar and Marquise or Andrews and have two lines players, I'm okay with that. I also like if you're going to play Justin Fields, running him completely naked. I don't like stacking him at all. That way you can still play the high-priced options and get the rushing upside of a quarterback who could struggle in a terrible spot through the air. Also, everyone's going to try to stack him, and he doesn't need to be stacked to hit. You can take the rushing floor alone and then pay for more premium options. So I don't mind Justin Fields if you're going to play him uniquely by himself because no one's going to think to play him by himself. And so that's a unique way to get uh, access to him. And then also, I do like the afternoon skinny stacks I talked about with Van Jefferson and Gronk and waiting to pivot to 
Higby and I guess worst case scenario, Scotty Miller or something like that. I think that's the way to play that game and just hope for like one touchdown for both those players. Even if it goes under, we still get that equity. So that's the way I think I'll be playing that game. Uh, there's one game we haven't really touched on. It would be the Gi- the Giants uh, Falcons game, which I was super shocked to see. Like, I just have no faith in the Giants to put up points, and the Falcons also look, uh, you know, pretty not good through two weeks. Especially in like uh, like they have talent, but I just don't think they're utilizing it unless it's Cordell Patterson in an optimal way. But uh, the game ended up open with a 48 and a half total. I think that came down one point, but that's still a total that puts it in play for tournaments. Like I think mm-hmm. on a slate with so many good games, you don't have to go like stack Jacoby Brissett for quote leverage. The game is a 44 total. They're not going to score any points. I don't think you need to do that. This game is a 47 and a half total. And it's got a quarterback in Daniel Jones, who is legitimately one of six guys who has hundred yard, like has the hundred yard bonus upside on the ground. And while their defense doesn't actually look good, that's going to push them to the 35, 40 attempt range. He's been, I believe, 32 and 37 past attempts over the previous two weeks. So uh, is this game, I think this game, I thought, uh, given Daniel Jones, very minimal price, I think he's 5,900. I thought it would end up being kind of popular. But so far, uh, I think the game that there's always a stack where everyone's like, no one's going to tell you this in the content space, but this one's pretty sneaky. I think you you rightly pointed out where you're like, I'm going to play some Lamar Jackson. And then everyone says that. I think Daniel Jones, I thought was going to be that stack. I don't think he is. I think it's going to end up being not a particularly popular way to construct your roster is to just play like, you know, not too expensive Sterling Shepard, Daniel Jones. And then you can run it back with either Kyle Pitts or Calvin Ridley because the other side is so condensed. I think that's one of the most advantageous spots to take it, you know, to, to take pieces of is a spot where you know without a doubt you are going to be able to get the decision right. If the Falcons go off, I am confident one of two guys probably did it, Kyle Pitts or Calvin Ridley. So your decision tree is very small in this game. Yeah, I love it. Uh, We should probably expect this game to go over as well, unless last week's breakout from the Giants offense was a product of Jason Garrett having coached against the same team for a decade plus, and he was familiar with them. If that's not the case, and Daniel Jones' seven and a half carries per game holds up, that's how he beats Justin Fields and all the cheap options you're going to play. That's why I think we should probably mention Cardinals Jaguars as well. Like Trevor Lawrence in a double stack with DJ Shark and Marvin Jones is awesome. Uh, it has to get there. It may suck. It probably will suck, but it's awesome given that we know the Cardinals will probably run rampant over them. And we know the Jaguars have passed at the 75% rate with a lead with a, while trailing this year. So if we expect them to trail, they're going to throw. And so we know who the options are to go to with him. And those are the pivots, Jones and Lawrence, from Justin Fields, who are arguably both in much better spots than Justin Fields. So uh, given that Daniel Jones can match the rushing floor even, and Trevor Lawrence with just three carries hasn't, I'm not saying he can't, but he hasn't just yet, and they've proved they don't want to run him too much, then Daniel Jones is an awesome play. I would even go Galladay over Sterling Shepard, because I think Shepard's going to come in highly rostered. No one's going to play Galladay. And you're trying to get the touchdown equity. If you play Daniel Jones from away from Saquon Barkley, he's going to be top five rostered. So you're playing like the guys who can score touchdowns. And that is Daniel Jones legs. And hopefully Kenny Galladay coin tosses through the air. So I I like it a lot. The more we talk about this late, the more I think there are so many, uh, like you, you start off this late very confidently saying every spot you found that was going to be popular, you have a pivot that you like. That's an like, awesome that's, pivot. I know. I was like, that's pretty bold. I don't know if I feel as confident. I You have roped me in to feeling like, uh, you know, for me, we keep talking about games that I think have shootout potential or at least price adjusted. Like you don't have to, you don't need 45 points from the from the Jaguars for Marvin Jones to pay off his 4,900 salary. Marvin Jones, who has had over 100 air yards in back-to-back weeks, DJ Shark on the other end began the season with 199 air yards like you need three big plays in that game for that double stack to pay off and even if you just use them as runbacks to kyler murray i think paying so much for kyler murray when we know like derrick henry is going to be popular maybe that doesn't come in as popular as we expect just because like uh, if you play derrick henry you're playing the not cheap middling priced uh you know rams type of stack Mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to get a ton of popularity on Kyler Murray. So, and especially, I don't think you're going to get a ton of a popularity on something like DJ Chark or something. So I think that's just another advantageous spot where is the odds of that game shooting out, especially on the Cardinal side, that much different than this Rams game. I really don't think so. How we need to talk about this before we get out of here too. How would you approach Rondell Moore? If DeAndre Hopkins is ruled out because it's a noon, it's a 1 PM game. We're going to get the news before the slate. Uh, I think it's very clearly overweight on him on the entire field because he's not a player given that he leads the team in targets on the six fewest routes on the team 
that I want to fade with increased usage. But I'm curious on your thoughts on it. Yeah, it's the same way that I view uh, Chase Claypool this week sans Deontay Johnson is we know that when on the field, uh, you know, Claypool is playing closer to like 70 percent. He's right around 70 percent of the team snaps, whereas Rondale is not even anywhere close to that yet. But we know when these two players on the field, they're both super athletes at very different sizes, but both like 90th plus percentile athletes. They have an ability to draw targets that few other players have and then the ability to make the most out of those targets. So for I, I was thinking the exact same argument with Chase Claypool is why I bring him up is that when you guarantee this player you know if deandre hopkins is out we already know deontay johnson is out Mm -hmm. when you guarantee this player a near every down role they're going to have this potential for like exponential growth whereas you know like christian kirk picking up all these snaps like great he's probably you know we saw a few weeks ago he can go off but i don't think christian kirk getting a few extra routes really makes a big difference whereas rondale who when he's on the field is a focal point of the offense picking up to you know 80 percent snap share yeah I, I probably would be significantly over the field on on him and more importantly i would just continue to bolster up my kyler murray stacks because for me the the only concern i have with kyler murray is that if deandre hopkins plays i don't know if we get how expensive kyler murray is if at their 99th percentile kyler murray is 100 percent correlated with deandre hopkins because kyler murray at his greatest probably puts up 100 yards and a rushing touchdown. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's just 100 yards and a touchdown that you can't get from DeAndre Hopkins. You're okay losing that with Rondale Moore because he's only 5,000. You don't need 35 points from Rondale Moore to win a GPP. You probably literally need 35 points from DeAndre Hopkins to win a GPP because of how expensive he is. So given that the overall cost of the stack goes down dramatically, like $3,000 on DraftKings, if DeAndre Hopkins is out, I'm moving up even more Kyler Murray. And yeah, I'm probably just like eating the Rondale chalk. And I want to remind everyone while we're talking about all these games that uh, be site specific as well. Like Daniel Jones is thinner on FanDuel since it's yeah. high in touchdown ec- or thinner on FanDuel since we were looking for the rushing bonus, that extra five yards from him. Um, same for cheap quarterbacks, Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence. Like if you say who is more likely to get the 5.300 yard bonus, of course it's Trevor Lawrence over Justin Fields. So just be aware of those because that makes them better options, for instance, on DraftKings than on FanDuel where someone like Justin Herbert, who's much cheaper than the other high-end quarterbacks, can still match those guys with 300 yards and three or four touchdowns without the bonus. Also like running backs in particular, Mike Davis may be a good spin of Cordero Patterson on DK, but it's just so thin on Fandle since we're trying to get touchdowns. So you just have to be very wary, which is why we talked about Jonathan Taylor as a pivot, especially on Fandle, because of course, like he has those carries in the goal line, just a matter he hasn't scored yet. So like, that's where you want to pivot site specific. Also, everything we showed throughout the show, uh, player rankings and the DFS optimizer and player projections and going through all the tiers, it's all available, remember, on the back end of the site. So you can actually sign up with the NBC Sports Edge Plus at a discount with our promo code from the show, Good10, and it gives you a 10% discount off your annual subscription. So go use that if you enjoyed anything throughout the show or when we talk about in the in the middle of the week on our podcast in the preview show about our rankings and tiers and debate them. All those are available right now behind the scenes. So you can use the promo code good 10 and go get that done. Kyle, before we get out of here, any final thoughts that people need to take away into week three? Um, I, so I was, I just randomly was scrolling and saw the name Jamar Chase. And even if T Higgins uh, is playing, but less than 100 percent, just another one of these fantastic spots where I think, uh, you know, Joe Mixon, I think will be particularly popular. You said you were disappointed that you, that you found out that he'd be popular. Just yeah. like Jamar Chase, just every every spot we have. I don't think there are infallible spots this week unless like arguably uh, like Rondell Moore, I think would be borderline i would just say like ah, i'm just gonna eat the chalk he's just that good of a play when you give an 80 percent snap share and alexander madison would kind of fall into that grouping for me essentially i don't think there are any of those plays without that those two pieces of news breaking yet so just like i, I will continue to look to be contrarian as i said last week it didn't work out and that's okay it works out like once every 15 weeks at, at best really depending on your tournament size it works out once every five years if you're playing you know even not even the millie maker the millie maker is once every like 50 years legitimately it's how long it takes to win that tournament but uh, I'm going to continue to look be, to be contrarian and Jamar Chase is just a name that reiterated that point to me. And I don't mind playing Bingle. I'm going to probably play a Bingle, but I will say like if I have Chase or Mixon in my lineup, I'm going to play. Man, I think the Bengals defense is a really good play this week. A really good play, especially because everyone's going to come in on the Titans at cheap. So I think I'm going to have a lot of the Bengals defense as a contrarian, just like another option, an alternate as well 
on my defensive side. And that's that's actually my final thought. That's what we're going to end it here. Right. So remember, he is at Kyle Tweets here on Twitter. I'm at not Jay Daigle on Twitter. And if you have start sits or any DFS questions, just know we are uncomfortable with you throughout the slates on Sunday as well. We are right there playing with you. So feel free to ask questions or just sweat with us at the time. We will be back Sunday morning, noon Eastern for your start sit questions that we absolutely purposely did not get to this afternoon. So join us then to preview the slate, talk about all the last minute Schefter bombs throughout the night on Saturday evening, and we'll start sit the correct players together then. So until then, next Friday, every Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, good luck this week. We'll see you next week. See you guys.